All right, let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ who came as our Savior and who is now our Lord. As we seek to understand what that truly means, would you grant us insight into your word, understanding, and may we walk in the way in which he commanded. For Jesus' sake, amen. We started the doctrine of Jesus Christ uh, quite a while back. Uh, we're just doing a basic overview of what's called systematic theology, giving you hooks on which to hang your Bible knowledge. So when you talk to somebody, you've got the basics right. We talked about the fact that Jesus is God, fully God, and therefore everything we studied before that on God and all his perfections is fully true of Jesus Christ in every way. Then we also spoke about Jesus is man. Uh, he took on manhood at the incarnation when he was conceived in Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit. And since then, he's been what we say the God-man, fully God and fully human. Last time we looked at Jesus is Savior, perhaps the most common truth about Jesus Christ and what that all means for us. We looked at some big words and theological concepts that just blow your mind as to what is really necessary for salvation. And now we get to Jesus is Lord. Now typically, like Jesus is Savior, this is, Jesus is Lord is typically in the, in the discussion of salvation and what it means for our life. We talk about lordship salvation. You are saved not just to be free from sin and condemnation, but also to obey Jesus, <laughs> to obey God. And there's a big controversy in, in Christianity over the two millennia of Christianity <laughs> um, as to whether that's actually the case or not. Uh, in most Christian circles, lordship salvation is frowned upon, saying it's an unbiblical doctrine because it, it means now your works are important again. <laughs> And we know works are not important, salvation is by grace. And so by, by confusing obedience for legalism, they've done away with obedience altogether. It doesn't matter how you live, you're still a Christian. A lot of Christians you know are like that, okay? They themselves perhaps, their spouse, their, their parents, their, their child has walked away from the faith, but they're still saved and we thank the Lord for that and we pray that the Lord will bring them back. Like, no, we're praying for his salvation. <laughs> he's not saved if he's not obeying the Lord. Okay, so it's actually a big contentious issue, Lordship salvation. Now, we'll talk about that in fuller length, I'm sure, when we get to soteriology, the theology of salvation. Today, we're talking about the theology of Jesus Christ. What does God say about his Son, Jesus Christ? And he says that Jesus is Lord. We have to start with that because that will one day help us answer the Lordship salvation thing. And I'll touch on it just because we can today. Jesus is Lord. It's a very significant truth in the New Testament. <clears throat> in fact, <laughs> the word Lord is perhaps the most common designation for Jesus Christ. Over 700 times in the New Testament, Jesus is called or referred to as Lord. Now, sometimes it's just Lord, and by context you figure out it can only be Jesus Christ whom he's talking about. Other times it's the Lord Jesus, very common in Scripture, or even the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just lumped together, all three of them. So it's, it's title, first name, and then, I guess, job description um, is perhaps the, the plainest way of describing Christ. The anointed one, the one who came to fulfill Old Testament prophecy and save sinners. Jesus is Lord. There's no way around that. The most common designation for Jesus Christ is Lord. Sometimes just simply Lord. The Lord, our Lord, your Lord. <laughs> what does Lord mean? Well, perhaps the shortest definition is simply to say sovereign master. Uh, you you kind of need both of those in your definition somewhere, both sides. One is sovereignty, he's God. Um, being Lord is kind of a natural, necessary consequence of being God. Okay? It's, it's hard to divorce those two. He's sovereign, he's over everything. Um, that's why in, in the, the old British traditions, 
um, that always feature again when royal, something happens with royalty, right? All of a sudden there's lords and sirs and this is and that. A lord was, was the, the one who's sovereign over a piece of land. Okay, th those were, those were your, your land holders. They were the ones who had people working for them. They were the influential people. So you had, had the lords who assist the king with his duties. <clears throat> sovereign in some sphere. So Lord is, is the sovereign one, the one who's, who's over things, in this case, over everything. The other side for the title Lord is master. And I say that because some theologians try and separate the two. And they say, no, Lord is basically just a designation of being God. He's sovereign. And so you can get away with living not like a Christian, even though Jesus is your Savior. <laughs> so again, they try that. You have to say sovereign master. He's in charge and he gets to tell you what to do. Okay, now in a, in a culture that doesn't really operate by master-slave kind of, of rules, uh, we lose some of the significance of having a lord. The <laughs> okay, lord tells you how to live. It's like a slave-owner slave kind of relationship. A slave owner can say what he wants. The slave has to do it. That's kind of the nature of slavery, okay? Um, <clears throat> that's why it's, it's, it's not something that we recommend as a way of, of operating in this world, because there's that comprehensive power over another and an obligation from the other to do whatever is said. That is, though, a great way to describe our relationship to Jesus Christ. Okay, slave, slave owner, slave master. That's actually a great picture for the Christian life. Thankfully, we have a perfect master, so we don't have any of the horrors of it. We only have the blessings of it. So, Jesus is Lord means Jesus is my sovereign master. And we should probably live this out and talk this way a little more often in Christianity. Okay, how often have you said something like, um, I, I really want to do this or that, but uh, my boss needs me to come in for work? Okay, common phrase, anybody? Is it, is it just me that sometimes has to say things like that? Okay. <laughs> um, we say things like that because it's true. Life works that way. There's people that control how we spend our Friday night sometimes. <laughs> Isn't that a great definition for Jesus as Lord? There's somebody who controls what I do with my time and my resources. Okay, so if your boss says you have to come in, so now you can't play video games, then go in. Okay, go do something useful. But if your boss says you can't come to church on Sunday afternoon because I need you to finish this project, then you say, well, actually, no, my boss says I can't come. <laughs> okay, same concept. My Lord has a different requirement for me. I've got obligations that I need to fulfill, specifically on a Sunday afternoon, that I can't fulfill later because there's a, it's, it's a meeting related. <laughs> I have to be there. We have to fellowship together. We have to worship together. I still have to do that. I haven't done it yet this week. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, my, my Lord says I can't come. <laughs> You're struggling with sin. And sin says, hey, here's, here's something, go fulfill your desires. And you're like, actually, my Lord said I can't do that. <laughs> my boss said I can't come tonight to, to do that. I have to do something different with my time tonight. It's useful, isn't it? <laughs> Simple concept, a word you've probably put next to Jesus Christ in your prayers and in your praises and in your Bible reading many, many times. <laughs> and this is the significance of that term. <clears throat> Here's a great definition for the Lordship of Christ. Uh, MacArthur and Mayu, I tried to quote from that so that we have one book as point of reference. Page 932, by the way, doesn't just prove it's a big book. That's after the chapters. That's in the glossary at the end of the book. Okay, there's a glossary. There's all kinds of indices for different things, scripture index. So if you're like, what does this verse mean? You can actually go and see, oh, this verse is quoted five times in his book or whatever, and you can see, maybe get some insight. There's also a glossary, which is just definitions for key terms. Super helpful, okay? Um, we were discussing what biblical theology, the term biblical theology, and the glossary has a little definition for it. 
Okay? So, so if, if I ever preach and use words that I shouldn't really be using and I'm not aware of it, then go to that glossary at the end of the book and see if you can find it. It'll probably give you a cool little definition. Here's the definition for the Lordship of Christ. It's in the glossary. It's a phrase that you can find under L. Jesus Christ's authority, that's the Lordship of Christ. It's His authority and rule over all things, especially as reflected in the life of the Christian. <clears throat> He's got authority to say what he, whatever, and He actually executes that authority. He uses it to rule. It's not just, I could be in charge if I wanted to be, but I'm not going to do anything about it. No, He could, and He did. <laughs> He has the authority to, and then he used it. That's the lordship of Christ. We attribute to Christ lordship, which means he's got authority and rule over everything in this world, especially over me. And that's why Paul many, many times refers to himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. Your English typically says servant because slave is a bit offensive and in the English-speaking world. It's, it's the word slave, used in the Greek-speaking world when slavery was just as bad, if not worse. <laughs> okay, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Why? Because He is my Lord. He has the authority over me to say whatever He wants to say, and He has said things with that authority that I'll submit to. Comments or questions on this before we get to the key verses on it? Sorry, say that again? And he, and he has bought me with a great price. Okay, so slavery concept goes well because he purchased you. <laughs> <clears throat> Anything on the Lordship of Christ up to now? Jan? Maybe uh, some of the references in the New Testament him as the Lord Jesus. Mm. In many ways, the title Lord is just the, the quickest way to refer to everything that, that Christ is. He's preeminent, the Colossians 1 reference, okay? That means He's first above and before anything else. Okay, before you consider anyone's input in your life, your own desires input, anyone else's input, you first consider Christ, preeminent. And all the things in the world, things rank higher and lower than different things, but above them all and before them all, Jesus Christ is. <laughs> Everything is first about Jesus Christ and then second and third about something else perhaps. <laughs> That's the preeminence of Christ. And the word Lord actually just describes that. All right, let's look at some verses. <clears throat> There's not many verses today because the verses that we do have are striking. Acts chapter 2. Verse 36, <clears throat> excuse me, Acts chapter 2, verse 36, perhaps the best verse on Jesus' Lordship. <clears throat> Paul, uh, sorry, Paul, Peter, Paul's not saved at this stage yet. Peter is preaching in Jerusalem to the Jews who had crucified Christ. And he says this, verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain. Okay, it's one of those cool verses that are going to tell you this is something you, you can just, you can, you can take this to a bank. You can put all your eggs in this basket. L know this for certain that God has made him We'll figure out who them is just there. God has made him, this person, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You have to sense the full weight of that statement just in that context first. These people, under the rule of Rome and under the influence of their spiritual leaders, had crucified the person whom God made the Lord of everyone and the Christ who fulfills everything in the Old Testament for these Jews. You're in trouble. You're in trouble if 
your next level boss told you to kill the boss above him. And then the boss above him comes up, gets resurrected, and says, now let's talk about what happened here. <laughs> right? Do you understand the significance of the title Lord in this verse? You have crucified the Lord over you. The one whom God said is the Lord over you. Okay, this is not like in the COVID-19 discussions of, of can government tell churches to close the church, blah, 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 what's the higher authority? This is God said so. He is the authority, <laughs> and you killed him. But there's something significant theologically in the statement too, not just for them. Sorry, I just need to find the verse again. God made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. When it comes to evangelism, how in typical evangelism is the lordship of Jesus shared to somebody who wants to get saved? I know there's lots of possible answers to that. What are some of them? How do you talk about lordship of Jesus Christ in typical evangelism? Amelia? Mm. Kind of speaking to someone as though they're saved, even though they have not accepted Christ. Yes. Okay, so sometimes it gets separated. Accept Jesus Christ as Savior, as personal Savior. And that's it. Because the Lordship just gets ignored sometimes. <laughs> um, or people say, I, I, I've accepted him as Savior, but I, I still haven't accepted him as Lord. I'm working through that kind of distinction. How else? You talk about the Lordship of Christ and evangelism sometimes. Or just the, the representation of Christ as well. When someone witnesses or shares their testimony, you might have a word and say that as well. It's an option you can load on board or not. But, but it's yes. Christ presenting Christ in an accurate way as Lord of all, and you can either submit. He's my Lord and Savior. It's all about me in our times, isn't it? Everything is about me. Paul didn't go to him and say, make sure he's my, your Lord. He said, he is your Lord. <laughs> Sometimes we talk about it in evangelism also in the sense of make him your Lord and Savior. Do you see what this verse says? God made Jesus Lord. <laughs> That's a significant statement. <laughs> okay, we'll look at one other verse, but this one will do actually. You don't make Jesus Lord of your life. You don't choose if you're going to make him Lord of your life. He is the Lord of your life. That's why in evangelism, when people are like, yeah, but I, I, um, I, I don't want to believe. It's like, well, you still have to. <laughs> yes, but I don't know if I think Jesus is the only Savior. He is, and you have an obligation to believe it. <laughs> You don't make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. You need to live it out. So actually, we could probably use the word accept. It was mentioned a bit earlier. You can accept Jesus as Lord. That means you're actually willingly submitting to his lordship. But he is already Lord. Jesus is Lord. God made Jesus Lord. You don't need to make him Lord. <laughs> Isn't that just a wonderful eye view of Jesus? It's kind of like Jesus is back to where he really is in our minds. <laughs> Another verse is Romans 10. <clears throat> Romans 10. This is also an evangelistic encounter again. Or not encounter, really. It's a description of evangelism. Acts 2. When you evangelize a lot of people, you tell them Jesus is Lord. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> Romans 10 describes the process of evangelism as well. And it says this, verse 9. <clears throat> because, okay, so he's talking about evangelism, things like that. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because a little bit longer than the gospel presentation in Acts 16 was, but it's not that much longer. <laughs> Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's evangelism. 
Jesus is Lord, you need to start living it out. Okay, remember the word confession doesn't just mean saying sorry for your sins. It actually has nothing to do with sorrow. Confession is simply stating the truth as I believe it to be true now. I now recognize the truth. Okay, so confession about sin is um, this, I believe this is sin, and I do say I have done it. I'm matching up my statements to the realities of that sin in my actions. Positively speaking, a confession of faith, for example, is I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in one God and Father of all, uh, whatever. Okay, that, that's a confession of faith. To confess something is simply to say, with my mouth, I'm very loudly going to say what is objectively true. My confession doesn't make it true. It just demonstrates that I finally submit to the truth of this statement. We confess Jesus as Lord. That's a criterion for Christianity. That's how you get saved, according to his verse. As you look at the Lordship of Christ, which is objective, I have nothing to do about that reality. And I'm going to look at it now and say, this Jesus who is Lord, I want everyone to know he is my Lord indeed. <laughs> Unlike the rest of the world that says, well, even if he is Lord, he's, I'm still not going to live as though he is my Lord. That's a great combination, these two verses next to each other like this. The objective reality about Jesus Christ is Jesus is Lord. It's a state of being. It's a status. <laughs> and now as Christians, we look at that doctrine and say, what are we going to do about that reality? Well, we're going to make sure everybody else also knows that Jesus is Lord. <laughs> he is my Lord. That's where the personal element now does come in, and it's necessary. Now, that's how you get saved. It's also the now you're going to live. Not really the topic of Christology, study of, of Christ, but the natural implication, right? I'm going to confess. I'm going to use my tongue to make people know that Jesus is going to take in control of my life. Okay, I submit to him. He's my boss. And I'm going to say things like, actually, my, my boss doesn't allow me to do this, this, or that. <laughs> to my own soul when I'm tempted to sin, to others when I'm being distracted by the things of this life, Christ is my Lord. Comments or thoughts on these two verses and the theological implications? Anybody awake? Oh, okay, you're awake. <laughs> it's cool, isn't it? Mm. In this context, it's like, you know, especially in Zulu, you know, I, I used to sort of like get, get lost because it, it, it's like when you just pronounce or just say uh, okay. Jesus mm. you know, is, is, is Lord, then you will be saved. But, but then now, as you've just explained it, it just adds more weight, you know, to mm. it's not a matter of saying, but it's like a statement of agreeing. Yes. So now you, you finally realize that Jesus is. Mm. You know, so, yeah. It's not reciting the, the syllables, <laughs> okay? It is agreeing. There's a good word, agreeing. Confession is agreement. I agree verbally with the objective reality, whatever it might be. Very good. All right, so Jesus is Lord. He is the authority. He's the rule over all things, especially the lives of believers. What do you think that means for Lordship salvation then? If you're saved, you actually have to obey this Lord. Yay or nay? Yes, absolutely yes. Resounding yes, right? <clears throat> uh, by the way, look at verse 12 just quickly. Um, we're in verse 9, confess with your mouth. Verse 12 says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call upon Him. Okay, there, absolute truth. You can go to anyone in the world, it doesn't matter how different they are to you, and you already have one thing in common. Jesus is Lord of us both. <laughs> I confess him, you don't yet. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about why this is so important. 
talk about a common level playing field for evangelizing very different cultures and peoples. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord and He's the Lord of all. In any case, that brings us then to Lordship Salvation. So, on the same page, because it's under L in the gloss, uh, Lordship Salvation is the teaching, I had to put this in here, okay, the teaching that saving faith is characterized by repentance of sin and acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord as well as Savior. Lord and Savior, and you cannot separate the two. Salvation is not just Jesus saved you from the condemnation of your sins. It's also he's training you to renounce ungodliness in the words of, of Titus chapter 2 and 3. You cannot have salvation without lordship. Or to put it the other way around from observing the lives of others, if you do not have evidence of lordship, then you cannot have evidence of salvation. If somebody says, I'm a Christian, I've always been a Christian, or I got saved when I was whatever, 15 years old, and um, I'm just not walking with the Lord right now, and um, <clears throat> things like that, then you're like, well, if there's no lordship of Christ in your life, then there's also no salvation from Christ, by Christ, I should say. We have to connect the two. You cannot have the one without the other. John MacArthur has said it well. He says, you cannot have Jesus as Savior if you will not have him as Lord. Or well, I saw a quote today from, I think it was Martin Luther, that said, the grace that enables salvation is the same grace that enables obedience. <laughs> That's from, let's turn to it, Titus, I think it's Titus 2 where it talks about the grace in particular. First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. Yes, Titus 2, verse 11. Okay, here's your Lordship Salvation verse. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And everybody said, Amen training us to renounce ungodliness and to live uh, ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You cannot have salvation if you will not have lordship. You cannot be saved from your sins if you will not obey, repent of those sins, and do what is right instead. You cannot say, I am saved, but I'm just not living like one. That cannot happen. Because Jesus is Lord. And if he saves, then he also commands. In fact, his first commandment was repent. <laughs> we are his servants. We are his slaves. You don't have a choice whether you want to obey or not anymore. The choice has been removed. So in a sense, if people say, oh, what about free will? You can say, yes, you had free will until you got saved. <laughs> okay? You were free to disobey, and you used that freedom. Now you don't have the freedom to disobey. You are obligated to obey. Well, it's true categorically of all, but if you're going to claim the name of Christ, then it, you are confessing, you're agreeing, saying, I have an obligation to obey. My view of Jesus Christ requires it. You see how these doctrines that we're looking at are incredibly practical. It's not just, oh, believe things about Jesus, believe things about Jesus. These are true, and if you don't believe it's true, you're probably not a saved, you're probably a cult. These things have impact. What you believe about Jesus Christ is going to affect the way you live under Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is Lord is a very, very important lesson for us. Anything on that before we come to our closing verse, which has an extra little nugget of lordship for us? All right, turn. Sorry, somebody. Do people deny it? It's so obvious in a text. Yes, they deny it. Yes, it's obvious in a text. But here's why. 
Okay, here's the scenario. What if I come to you and, I'm, and, I'm, and we're talking and, and um, we're talking about Lordship of Christ and you ask about my family and I'm like, you know, I've got this brother. It's not true, okay? This is made up. My brother is a believer. <laughs> But I say, I've got this brother, and, and it's, it's so sad to see his life. He's just ruining his life. He's walking in sin. He's living like the world. He's departed from the faith. I'm just so glad, though, that he has that profession of faith, because when we were five, we once prayed together. Like, what do you do with that? That's very emotional, obviously. <laughs> and I'm not asking your opinion I'm not bringing up the topic of the Lordship of Christ. I'm just so glad that Jesus saved his soul because he's living a terrible way. And if, that wasn't, if Jesus didn't save him when he was five, he would have gone to hell for his lifestyle. I'm so, so grateful for the grace of Christ to save him because otherwise I, I wouldn't know what I'd do with this. I, I, I'd probably die out of anxiety for his soul. And you almost feel compelled to say you should die over anxiety over a soul. <laughs> you should. It should eat you up. <laughs> Don't take confidence from a profession of faith earlier in his life if now he's not living like it at all. <laughs> Yes, we all sin, but we don't have a pattern of willful sin knowing that it opposes what Christ commanded. We repent when we find that out. <laughs> okay, lots of us have lived in sin for a long time, but then eventually we figure it out and we stop. The grace that saves us enables us. So yes, how can people possibly deny Lordship salvation? You won't, you'll be surprised to find out it's a vast majority of Christianity on a theological arguing about it level even. And with lordship, they just say Jesus is God. And they don't actually say it requires of you obedience. Yes, he does. Yes, his anxiety over those who have all made a profession of faith, in a sense, by getting circumcised <laughs> and weren't walking with the Lord at all. It burdened his heart. <laughs> so the Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So how, do, how can you talk about people in that, the scenario I just described and say your your brother's probably not saved? Then, <laughs> okay, let's start praying for his salvation. They typically get offended when you say, let's pray for his salvation. They're like, no, no, just pray that he comes back to the Lord. Uh, what, what's the word? That he rededicates his life. Um, <clears throat> how, do we, how can we with confidence say, that person is probably not saved? Well, number one, church discipline is literally, you can say, with the authority of God, that person is not saved. Now, most churches don't do church discipline, so you actually are at a disadvantage because you're not the elders, you're not part of that church, so you cannot with the authority of God say it. But you can, using 1 John, uh, look at 1 John. <clears throat> um, chapter 2. You can go to 1 John and say, I might not be, I have a church discipline level of clarity from God on it, but I have a 1 John level of clarity, which is still God's clarity, obviously. Because the first verse 1 of chapter 2, 1 John 2, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for sins of the whole world. So you're already in that category, in the topic of we also sin. <laughs> okay, but chapter 1 says we confess our sins, verse 9. We don't say we have no sin. We say, yes, we have sin, and we confess it. And then we have an advocate who intercedes for us, and we're restored to God. A propitiation means this advocate absorbs your condemnation. 
Verse 3, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Assurance of faith has lots of things that help, but obedience is one of them. <laughs> if there's no obedience, there shouldn't be assurance of faith. If there is obedience, there can be assurance of faith. Verse 4, whoever says, I know him, I am a Christian, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, if he's a liar, what is he lying about, according to this verse? He's lying about, I know Jesus. He's lying about, I am a Christian. It doesn't mean everything he says is a lie. It's about the statement that he just said. If he says, I am a Christian. If, if I say my brother is a Christian, but my brother is not keeping the Word of God, then I am lying about my brother being a Christian. That's a pretty clear verse. <laughs> And that's why John is writing this. He says, I'm concerned about you because you have created this everybody is a Christian category while nobody is obeying the Lord category. <laughs> and I want you to know that no true Christian will say I'm without sin and no true Christian will continue in sin. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. We have to walk as he walked. So I think it's a very helpful verse to go to because you can say, how do you know he's a Christian? I know he professed Christ um, five years ago. We were at the church camp. It was just a wonderful experience. And he professed Christ as a Savior. He accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, whatever phrase you want to go with. And you're like, okay, but that's not the criteria here in 1 John. It doesn't say by this we know that we know him if we have a salvation story. It says, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, keeping his commandments can't make you know him, but if you know him, you will keep his commandments. And that distinction we have to keep very clear. Well, that brings us then to <clears throat> the verse we always end with. Turn there. 1 Peter 3, verse 15 and 16. The reason we always end with this verse is because it's the evangelism verse. It's the verse that says you need to know what you believe, where your hope is, so that you can answer people who ask you about these things. That's why we're doing this class. So we have knowledge. We have hooks to hang our Bible knowledge on. So somebody comes and says, but why on earth? You're the weirdest guy ever. You believe the strangest things. Why are you following a Jew in any case? You can take off a hook of Jesus Christ and say, well, this is what we believe about Jesus Christ. He's actually Lord of all, not just Lord of the Jews. So this would work. But look at the actual wording in this verse. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. It's talking about um, evangelism in an in a, a opposition context. It's not somebody who's willing to listen. But they're, they're mocking you. They're saying, why do you believe this? Why don't you recant it so that you can not be persecuted instead? And then you need to have an answer. But in order to have an answer about all these things, you have to, not attain this class, you have to, in your hearts, Honor Christ the Lord as holy. Before you get up to evangelize, be it in a lovely setting where somebody is a seeker or where somebody is definitely not a seeker, you have to first and foremost say, whatever I'm going to say is dominated by the fact that Christ is my Lord. What I say is going to have to agree with what he said because he tells me what's truth. How I say it is going to have to be in such a way gentleness and respect because that's what he said I have to do. <laughs> because Jesus said so. <laughs> it's going to have to dominate the content and the method of what I say in all evangelism. Jesus is Lord. I think of it first, I'm like, Lord, in my mind, as I prepare for these things and as I talk to people in the moment, you dominate, you rule, you tell me what to say, I believe whatever you say, and I will do it your way and no other way. I won't get distracted by stuff, all last Sunday sermon basically, um, by other things, Christ is my Lord. And so, even in your evangelism verse, one of the famous evangelism verses, 
the Lordship of Christ is important. So, Jesus is Lord, that means he's your boss, he's your master, he's the one in charge. Let us pray for his grace to actually live like it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are God in heaven, you do as you please, you reveal yourself to us in truth, you are perfect in all your character qualities, and we believe the same about your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our God, our Savior, and indeed our Lord. Our Lord Jesus, we come before you humbly. We submit ourselves to you. We say, not our will, but yours be done, not only as our God, but more personally as the master over our lives. May we honor you this week in all that we do, say, think, in private and public, whatever it might be, May we honor you and demonstrate to the world and especially to one another by way of encouragement that you are the Lord and we are going to do what you say is important. Help us in this by your Spirit. For Jesus' sake, amen.